one. Phil, thanks for coming on the Stephen McCain podcast. Welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we met uh, briefly on a, a like a mastermind call months ago and I said, oh, this is the guy I've been wanting to meet for a long time. He's the bioregulating guy. And you mentioned a book that I actually had on my desk at the time because I was kind of re-referencing, you know, you know, learning that stuff. So I I'm really excited to introduce my audience to bioregulators, and you are the guy to do it. So thank you again for coming. Well, I hope we can help people out there. And because I like telling jokes, I'll slip this one in. People say it's very educational when they hear me talk. Well, they don't say that. They say it taught them a lesson. But uh, (laughs) let's let's hope we can help some folks. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you're a wealth of knowledge on this stuff. So when it comes to bioregulators, um, what are these things or what are we even talking about here? Like, let's just get down to the basics of what is a bioregulating peptide? Yeah, sure. Well, the term has come to be used for peptides that have two qualities. The first quality is that they're very short chains. So I think the folks out there know that all peptides are made up of amino acids. And it's when you've got two amino acids that have conjoined, that's what's technically called a dipeptide. Two, three, and four amino acids, they are short chain amino acids. They can be one classification for bioregulators, but there is a a separate condition, which I'll come to. But just to say that when you start adding more and more and more amino acids, you know, we can start changing the category. You might start calling them proteins. You might even start calling them hormones. So to take one of the longest examples, human growth hormone is a chain of amino acids made up of 191. So that's enormous. That really is enormous. And we'll talk about how the changing that length of string, as it were, changes the way that you need to use these products. So the first thing to know is that peptide bioregulators are short chains, two, three, four, okay? But they have a second quality that kind of needs to come from the research. And that is they act as gene switches. And, you know, as my old mentor, Dr. Wardeen used to say, there could be many, many more, we just don't know. And that's obviously true. But what we're going to talk about has principally been uh, was Soviet research. In fact, it was a Soviet military secret for many years. Now, of course, is freely available in Russia and Russian speaking countries. So it includes the Ukraine, it includes Kazakhstan and, you know, Georgia and other countries in that region. So yeah, gene switches. And that is a little flippant thing to say, but has enormous implications. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love the whole, like, I, I grew up in the Cold War era, Right. And so I was a kid in the eighties and I remember the first time I went to Moscow and I, I stood in the red square, uh, cause I was a, I got to go there for a competition. I remember thinking I'm not supposed to be here. It was like so cool. Like Moscow is a very interesting city to me. It's it's got this incredible architecture. Like it's, it's beautiful. I was there in 2019, believe it or not, and just visiting. And I, I couldn't believe how unbelievable the city was. Like it had just gotten better and better. But I went into a, like a, the equivalent of like a CVS or a Walgreens and I bought some Visomitten, which is a eye bioregulator, right? Like mm. it's, and I started using these drops. And mm. before I was in that, I was there for a week. Before I left, I looked at my screen a couple of days later and I thought, Wait, what did Apple do? Did they upgrade my the user interface? I was like, this thing is like brand new. And I thought, oh my God, these drops are working. Yeah. And so the these things you can get over there in Russia, you know, these tiny little bioregulating gene switches that can come in either a pill or you know, different delivery mechanisms, right? And and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. They they don't even need a a like a receptor they pass right through the cell membrane latch right onto the dna that's right and and help the dna start coding proteins to rebuild that particular organ because they're nano sized they actually and that's another thing as well the the oral ones they pass through the stomach wall they're not degraded by stomach acid because of their length that's very very short and we 
I can do the steak story as well, which I sometimes do at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do the steak story. So okay. basically, um, a lot of people know you want to put on muscle mass. You're, you're a natural bodybuilder. Um, one of the things you may do is you may eat lots of steak or salmon or something like that. So the question is, if you're trying to get protein, into you to build muscle and yet the steak you're eating the salmon you're eating is going all the protein in it is going to be degraded broken up in stomach acids how on earth does it build muscle well i think the answer to that is some of it is broken down into these short chains of amino acids which we now know not only pass through into blood act directly because of their nano size onto dna inducing specific and inducing protein synthesis so that i think is is the answer to that and people say oh it sounds intriguing but we don't really know do we because we've only heard about it five minutes ago well no unfortunately that's not true because this was this was work started 40 years ago and as i say during the soviet era it was a secret it was used by their troops it was used by their cosmonauts it was used by their olympic teams um, it's only since um, Perestroika that this stuff has now appeared on the market. And of course, for a long time, it was all in Russian. And, you know, now I'm not saying all of it, but much of it is in English. So it's suddenly opening up and the people are becoming aware of what these things are and what they can do. Yeah. And thank gosh, because they're they're so powerful. I mean, they're just amazing. And, and, and the thing I love about bioregulating peptides is they they make such uh, they make so much sense on like a simplistic level. They're not this medication there that it, it, it makes sense that if you want to build muscle, you eat the muscle of an animal, right? Like the, the and if I wanted to potentially uh, repair my liver, I might eat the liver of an animal or, or my heart. If I want to improve my heart, I eat the heart of an animal. There is this thing in nature that as these specific proteins that we share very similar with animals, like a heart is what, 99% the same in terms of the protein structures for an animal and us, as those things break down, they break into down into small chemical signatures. Yeah that turn on us repairing our own heart, right? And exactly. and all you they've done is systematize these things so that you can take them in pills or it's organ got, systems. It's become more accurate and it's become more potent because they can be specific extracts. It go right back to say the work of Western Price. And there's today there's the Western Price Institute who showed back in the 20s, 30s or 40s, that kind of time period, that he studied these um, native tribes in different parts of the world, and some of which, of course, don't exist anymore. And he was showing that because they were eating the whole animal, for one example, they were, there was a one tribe who were eating the necks. I think they may have been in Pakistan. I might Maybe the Hunzas, I think. I might have got that wrong. But they were eating the necks of animals and thus consuming the thyroid, right? And he couldn't find any trace of thyroid issues in these people. And of course, in those early periods, I mentioned 20s to 40s, the key doctors then were using organ extracts. They're still used today, don't get me yeah. wrong. Still used. But what I think has developed since then is we've got more specific into knowing what is in these tissues and how they're acting. And I think it's beginning to make sense. And what we should say is these um, peptide bioregulators they're in nature. They are in food groups. And what the Russians have shown with their research is quite amazing. They they work in humans, they work in animals, and got some very new news for you, which is only a few months old. University of Tel Aviv has been using these peptides in strawberries, and they're discovering that the plants produce nearly 30% more strawberries on the same plant. So what? even in... Yes. So and that is a magic number. We'll come back to the number 30 because uh, I'll, I'll get into that for you if you want me to. So they're used throughout nature. They're fundamental. Yeah. I mean, it's um, – and it, it's fascinating to think that you can get – it's still in this pill delivery because, you know, a lot of times when people think about peptides, they think, oh, I have to inject them. And, you know, I, I, I have yet to talk about peptides on this podcast. I am going to get into it because I've been using them for 10 years and I, I just never thought they would get this popular. And I guess now people have crossed that line where they're feel willing to inject themselves with a needle. And I think it's worth it. But these in particular, these bioregulated ones, you can just orally take them. It does set them apart from everything else. You're absolutely right. Partly as we 
talked about earlier about the length of this amino acid chain, you simply can't deliver a, a rather long string of amino acids, you know, through the mouth. There's a 50-50 chance it might have some effects sublingually, but really in terms of a drug delivery, it has to be injected or possibly as a nasal spray. But the problem with both of those routes is, is that even if you put vitamin C into a vial or into a nasal spray, most of the governments around the world will say that's a drug because of the nature of the delivery. So right. the fact that these, um, and by the way, there are 21 available commercially, um, the, the, the fact that these are in pill form and they work, and we can get into some of the aspects of what some of them are doing, makes them stand head and shoulders about, about above most of them that are commercially available today. Yeah, I think the implications for these, I think these things are going to be massive when they finally get their due, you know, spotlight. It, it, let me do real quick, just to kind of cover the basics, because the 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 naming conventions uh, and the there's synthetic, there's naturals. I just want to cover those real quick, you know, in terms of what would be the difference. You know, one I assume one is coming naturally from actual organ, organ uh, meat, and Correct. then the other one is... Cows, Coming, calves to be specific, yeah. Yeah, and then the synthetic ones are actually like engineered to synthetically to reproduce the same thing, right? Correct. Not so many of those available, eight or 10. I've got the number down pat, but there's 21 of the natural. Okay. But they mirrored. I mean, you know, it's thyroid or pineal or, you know, uh, unless you want me to get into the brand names, because it, it's like learning another language, unfortunately. There are so many crazy names. I normally stick to the gland or tissue names. Yeah, let's stick to the gland or tissue until we've, you know, really like laid down some some good fundamentals. But I I think that for for most people, they probably should just start with the naturals anyways, unless they're experiencing some sort of emergence of something where they need a, exactly. a synthetic. Exactly. Right? Well, I can tell you that in the Russian clinics where they utilize these both as injections and as orals. In the majority, of course, we're talking about more severe cases for people being treated in, in those cases. They tell me, and again, I would come back to, if you have a medical problem, you might want to consider this. If you don't, and you're looking in a supportive, um, regenerative kind of way, I don't think you need to go down this, this route. But basically, in Russia, in a clinic, they would start you on a synthetic. The class is known as cytogens. That's a class of the synthetics, okay? And they would start you on that, and they'd probably have you on that for a month, maybe a bit longer in some cases, but that's typical. And then after that month, they would switch you to the naturals, which as a class are known as cytomaxes. And I've asked the obvious question, well, why do you do that? And the answer has been the synthetics appear to work faster. However, the naturals last longer in, in their efficacy. So I would also say that the majority of the human uh, studies that have taken place, and we can get into some of those if you want to, have used the naturals. Okay, Got And it. there is also an argument, although this is a bit of a legalese, that the naturals are food supplements because they are extracts of cow. Um, yeah. And before anyone gets excited and says, oh, my God, mad cow disease or something like that, these, apart from the fact that the calves are specially bred and clean and checked and all the usual veterinarian in Denmark, by the way, for all the veterinarian processes, the actual size of the molecule, which is filtrated down, is nano. That's so small for a prion to cause a problem, to cause a disease, it has to be Dalton sized and that's much, much larger. So they simply cannot get into the product. Interesting. And in 40 years of application, there has never even been a serious side effect. Never mind a pre-arm. There's never even been a serious side effect. That's that's an that's a good thing to uh, to note. So what you're saying is just by getting down to the actual bioregulating level, mm -hmm. you are omitting yourself from having the ability to even carry certain things uh, that might be harmful. Right? It, it's yeah. Okay. That's exactly, it. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, you know, and also, you know, when I make the statement, no serious side effects, a lot of people rear back and say, because I mean, Professor Cavinson himself, who's the lead researcher in all this right from the inception, uh, back in the uh, back in the 80s, back in the early 80s, 
he reckons they've been dosed a hundred million times. So that's a lot, you know. Yeah. And, and of course, they were given to initially it was given to their elite troops, their cosmonauts, um, and Olympic teams. And they're not going to endanger those kind of people, right? Let's be honest. And I think it's because, and I should explain the word bioregulation because it is rather extraordinary. Please. Somebody said to me recently, it sounds like an adaptogen. So if anyone knows about adaptogens, I think, yes, it does follow in the same class. What am I talking about? Well, let's use the thymus as an example. So a lot of people out there are hypothyroid. Maybe not medically so, but they are. And I'm not making that up. That was originally done by Dr. Broder Barnes. And today his mentor, Dr. Rick Wilkinson, both American docs. And they've estimated that between 50 to 60 percent of the adult population has a weak thyroid. OK, so in other words, it could be hypothyroid, too little. Yeah. Thyroid. There are handfuls of people, not many, but there is hyperthyroid. In other words, they've got too much going on in the thyroid gland. And there are very big differences between these people. If you're hypothyroid, you could have poor metabolism. You might have cold hands and feet. Uh, your temperature control is not very good. You feel a bit tired you don't sleep very well blah 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 right yeah if you look at a hyperthyroid person they're almost the opposite they've got too much energy uh, they're hyperactive they're not sleeping very much etc etc yeah so these bioregulator peptides are turning on activating or silencing specific genes i don't think even professor cavinson knows how they know what to do right but here's the weird thing. They literally bioregulate between a parameter. So if you're in this, going back to the thyroid, just as the example, if you're a bit sluggish, they seem to activate the genes responsible for our thyroid glands to endogenously produce, naturally produce more thyroids. And of course, that means in the right area, because there's a, there are four different known thyroid hormones. But if you're hyperthyroid, it might silence the gene to bring you down within this parameter. OK, and I think although nobody fully understands how they know which way to go, <laughs> I think that's the reason for the safety, because if you were being treated for that problem and let's say you were taking a thyroid hormone every day, clearly you have to be monitored because you don't know what levels of thyroid hormones you have in your blood because you're throwing those tablets in every single day. Okay. Yeah. So you don't want to go too crazy or whatever. You want to get into that band. But these peptides appear to do it naturally. Okay. Yeah. And and th there is one caveat, of course, you need the gland. Yeah. Uh, it, it may sound silly, but there are people who've had their thyroids removed. So in a woman, for example, if she took the testes peptide, guess what? Doesn't do anything because she hasn't got any testes. <laughs> and in a man an ovary peptide won't do anything for them either. So there are, there's not many of the prostrate as well, but there's not many of those. We do share a lot of other things in common. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It, it, they're really, they do bring the body back into homeostasis. And I mean, I have a, a whole story with, um, you know, um, my fiance, they were, she was diagnosed with Graves disease, you know, like her thyroid, hyperthyroid was out of control. And, I had worked with the doctor. I said, we're going to use peptides. And I was like, you know, and I worked with this endocrinologist and I've told this story before, but we, we mm -hmm. fixed it and brought right. the thyroid and everything back into homeostasis. And he, he couldn't believe it because he just wasn't schooled in these things. And, uh, it, it, they really are, I just feel like it's, it, it's, look, let me ask you this because <laughs> I get so excited. I don't even know what to ask, but like when you eat certain, like, like we talk about, if you eat nose to tail, you are in fact getting some of these peptides, right? Like it's, you're already getting some of you, if you eat like this and all you were doing is saying, okay, let's take a little bit more of a structured approach and let's go after, how would someone go about this? Like maybe go after the lowest hanging fruit first? Yes. I mean, just quickly to go back on the food side of the equation, because there is something that fascinates me in that. I've got a I did warn you at the start of this, Stephen. I, I'm a raconteur. I like telling stories. So I love back, it. I love it. <laughs> back in 1981, I took my first degree in London, and it was it was called then food, and I'll use the British expression, and vitamin technology. And I think today we call it nutrition. But the, 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 the teacher on this specific day in the classroom put up on the overhead projector, who wasn't – sorry, folks, there were no PowerPoint then um, – a pie chart. And he said – 
this is typically what you find in food, okay? And it was X percentage of um, vitamins, X percentage of minerals, X percentage of oils. I prefer to use the word oils than fats. It saves a lot of confusion. But most of it was fiber. I think if I remember rightly, up like 55% or so was fiber. Now, in 1981, nobody was thinking a great deal about fiber. And the thought I had in my head on that day, 1981, was, well, either fiber is very important because I believe nature wastes nothing and we, you know, everything, uh, use everything. It's all energy one way or another, or they've missed something. So fast forward to my first meeting with Professor Cavinson, which I think was in 2009 or 10, where I heard him lecture in Istanbul. And he spoke about how these short chain peptides in foods act as gene switches. For me, it was a light bulb moment. It was an epiphany because it took me back to that classroom where I asked the question, have they missed something? And I think the answer is yes. They At that time, they missed the peptides in food. Hey, listen, there's going to be a lot else. I'm, I'm convinced whether it's light, electric, magnetism, you know, it's a matrix of things, isn't it? Yeah. I ended up working with the Russians to produce this book which is called Peptides in the Epigenetic Control of Aging. This is kind of serious. Scientific. I want to get that one. Is that because I have, I have I'll the, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll need to get that for sure. Yeah, that's a sort of scientific dive in, into things. But for me, I think these peptides acting as gene switches, individualized gene switches, explains epigenetics, right? Yes, you have to have the raw materials to, you know, to build the house, but you also have to have the manager, the blueprints, so if you think of the genes as sending the instructions, but the materials have to be available to still build the house, right? It's no good yeah. having the blueprints and the managers if the bloody building materials haven't turned up. I think it's the same in the body, that you still have to have both sides of this coin. Yeah. And and so I think that's a really, really fundamental uh, point for these peptides. Yeah. And you're using the innate intelligence of the body as a healing mechanism. I mean, we, we, a lot of times in medicine, it just seems like they, you know, you go against the innate intelligence and you just, let's cut it out. You know, let's cut the thyroid out. It's, it's, it's producing too much thyroid, you know, and it's absurd, you know, and I just feel this, this field of research and these bioregulators are, are so elegant. And the like it, uh, I, I just can't believe it's not even respected more and more known in the U in, in the U S here. Like it's kind of still sort of like, oh, is that Cavinson research? You know, mm. legit. I mean, it is legit, right? Why do people have such a, a problem with Russian like well, science? That's a generational problem. I, I was going to say my first visit to Russia, or oh, I can't remember where it was in the two thousands anyway. And I had to give a lecture and they asked me to say a few words. And I was absolutely genuine when I stood up and I said, I've never been here before. I said, and I have to admit to you, I came here with a certain amount of trepidation. And the only thing I really knew about Russia was it was a cold country. And as I was in St. Petersburg in February, it was cold. It was minus 25 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Uh, never been so cold, but there we are. And I, and I said to them, I said, you know, and I've come here and I can tell you, I've confirmed the fact that this is a cold country. But I'm so delighted to find it full of so many warm people, you know, that the, not only smart people, but genuinely nice people. And it reminds me of someone very famous, who I've forgotten who made the quote, when they said, and everybody, no care which country you come from, you can make this quote and you can say, I'm proud of my country. I'm just ashamed of my government. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's not the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 As, as somebody who's traveled to, you know, Russia many times and, uh, I, and I've had some of my best friends were from the Russian Olympic team and, you know, Olympic teams and fantastic people, great hearts. I mean, just, they are. and yeah. like, they've got one advantage over the West at the moment, I would say, and that is they still favor science engineering, what I would call proper subjects, okay? Yeah. And they don't kind of favor celebrity, you know what I mean? And all that yeah. stuff that, you know, they're, they're more practical than we are. And although it, I'm not saying it's 100% true, I think there is less politics involved in their science than we have in the West. Yeah. Okay? So, and I, and I like that because maybe we're actually looking at the results of whatever it is through the eyes of science and results and not through people's um, opinions and uh, 
whatever yep. else uh, things they want to get involved. So I think that's generally true. I'm not saying it's 100% true, but generally true. But here's the good news, right? When I get people say to me, oh, yeah, it looks fascinating. It looks great. And we've seen the publications and da 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 And some of this work was replicated by the National Institute of Aging in America. But we're not convinced. Well, here's the good news. There is an American doctor. His name is Bill Lawrence. He lives in Atlanta. And for about four years now, he has been, he's had 120 people, most of which are actually medical doctors, strangely enough, in a trial utilizing these peptides under the original Russian protocols. And he's now, after three years, he's published the results. And he actually came and spoke at our meeting in England uh, last year, which we call the Profound Health Summit. And if people are interested in videos, they can go there and find out. Uh, and we are going to invite him back for the next one, which is going to be May next year. And he's got something really interesting. He got, he's going to talk about organ regeneration. Nice. But what can I say about what he's discovered in these 120 people? Okay. Two things he was looking for very much, which we could say the Russians weren't, because most of the Russian studies were done in the night, human studies were done in the 90s and early 2000s. And they monitored for a lot of different things. But Bill, because his patients were healthy, there was nobody there that was diseased, just aging, just yeah. disorders of aging uh, on their way to disease, but <laughs> not <laughs> disease in the current sense. He monitored two things very closely, not the only things, but the two I'm going to mention. One is telomere length and, and the other one is uh, DNA methylation, which is the so, so-called Horvath clock. And we can get into those things. Yeah. Really. What's the good news? The good news is every single person extended their telomeres and every single person improved their DNA methylation. And those in the That's know huge. That's huge. It was hard to improve DNA methylation. Even Stephen Horvath, up until a few years ago, was saying, I don't think there's anything proven. Yeah, so it's profound. On average, I don't like averages, but on average in telomeres, the average patient improved their teleage, as it's called, the biological age of your length of your telomeres, in other words, improved the length of telomeres by 4.69 years, if memory serves on average. The best person was nine years. Okay. And something similar in DNA methylation, where you they got numbers of between three and five years. But those numbers actually speak greater volumes because um, Stephen Horvath produced a chart showing what it meant if you were biologically older in tele in your um, epigenetic age or biologically younger. And so, for example, if you're five years older in your DNA methylation age than your chronological age, you're a hundred percent greater risk of mortality. Yeah. Okay. But it, but if you're five years younger, unfortunately it's not the same number, but it's about 60 to 70% less risk of mortality. Yeah. Pretty significant. Yeah, the numbers blow up depending uh, with probably a few years difference in terms of like like aging does not help your mortality, right? <laughs> you know, so you don't want to be you, you know. Th it's very interesting that what you're talking about and this guy Bill Lawrence and I, I will include all this stuff in the show notes. Uh, it, it basically StephenMcCain.com backslash bioregulators. It's B I O R E G. U L A T O R S. And let's talk about, okay, someone's listening to this and they're, they're like, I'm on, I'm in, I, I really, I want to be a part of this. I want to start doing it. Where do they start? I mean, my, my, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I, let me just see if it, how good of a student I've been of this lowest hanging fruit, whatever organ systems you have right now. Like for me, like I have cardiovascular in my genetic lineage. So the blood vessel ones, I think is always a really good thing. That's also kind of an operating system upgrade because if you improve blood flow, you improve everywhere, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. No, these, these are all good things, Stephen. I mean, you know, if you're the kind of guy who's really deeply into this, the number one do is go and have tests and find out, right? That's yeah. obvious, right? You can, and, but of course, where do you start and where do you end, right? I mean, Who's the guy that's speaking at Rad this year who spent millions and millions of dollars on himself? I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, Brian Johnson. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, you know, not many people in that position, right? I mean, yeah. Because everything in life comes down to cost and convenience, right? Yeah. I'm sure we'd all like to drive a Ferrari, but it's not, you know, cost and convenience comes down to it. Anyway, 
Yeah. I met him, by the way. He's he's a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. I'll probably have him on the podcast at some point, yeah. but he's 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 fascinating. I, I met him in person and just really, really interesting. And, you know, I like what he's doing, you know. I mean, I don't agree with every single thing. When I look at his framework, I've I've gone through it, but it doesn't matter if I agree with everything. No mm. one is ever going to agree with everything, you know, no. period. No one's going to agree with what I do. No one's going to agree with, with whatever. So, you know, I, that's the trouble with medicine. Medicine has created an atmosphere of if this, do that. If that, do this. Ah, high cholesterol, statin. Ah, depression, Prozac. Life's not like that. <laughs> and the thing about anti-aging medicine is we are highly individualized and thus the approach to anti-aging has to be too. Yeah. And the thing that works for me may do nothing for you, Stephen, and vice versa, right? Yeah. So, And, of course, that makes it more complicated. It, it, it does create some issues. But in the long run, you know, people have often said, uh, oh, it's, you know, it's a bit costly to do all these things and blah, blah, blah. And I, my answer to that is, well, if you think health is expensive, try disease. Yeah, because, you know, if somebody gets a diagnosis of cancer, suddenly they're remortgaging the house and doing everything they can, right? Yeah. That's not where you want to be, obviously. Yeah. So we need a new approach. You know, you've probably heard this before. The ancient Chinese doctors used to get paid when people were healthy. In other words, as soon as they got a problem, they stopped paying the doctor. So it was in their interest to get them healthy again. Yeah. So interesting approach. Yeah, that, that's... That. <laughs> Uh, so that's hilarious, you know, and that's actually how it should be. Oh, funny. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, coming back to your, um, you know, you, you mentioned about eating from top to tail. Yes, absolutely. And our ancestors not that long ago, probably not even 100 years ago, wouldn't waste anything. Yeah. And if you look in England, if we look at old menus from the Victorian and Edwardian times, there were recipes for cooking testicles and uh, the you know the, the innards the guts and uh, also and you know people would obviously eat the black meat of a chicken as well as the white meat of a chicken and they'd stew the bones for soups and everything was consumed and I, I think there was a lot of protection in that which we now we've become so fussy oh i don't want black chicken meat oh no 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 you know yeah we've become so fussy about it. and 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 I also think that these different peptides, which are not only in these different animal tissues, but in different plants as well, also explains why we as humans have to eat a plethora of different foods. Yeah. It's, it's not as if we can just eat Brussels sprouts. You know, we need to eat other things. Exactly. Yeah. I So like, what, this is great, by the way, in terms of like a, a protocol and the degree of intensity for a protocol, like if someone is like for me, like I have to wear these damn glasses I have the lowest prescription, but it, it bothers me that I can have to wear anything. And so like for me, like I have the Visomitten eye drops, but I don't think by the time they get all the way to the US of A and they haven't been refrigerated, they lose their potency because they, they're not, not getting the same punch I did in, in, okay. in Moscow. So, don't forget some customs irradiate things by, oh, by really? coming off the, uh, you, you know, the um, container. Sometimes they get x-rayed. That could be a problem. I didn't know that. Per so day. Not every so, day. <laughs> No, it's a good point. So like for me, in order to maybe improve my eyesight and I imagine blood flow to the eyesight, uh, we already talked about the fact that, you know, with the cardiovascular history in my, in my, uh, you know, disease in my, in my family, I yep. would imagine the, the bioregulating peptide for the blood vessel and then the eyes, those two would probably be how would you recommend attacking that and what sort of a dosing protocol? Yep, absolutely. So uh, definitely the eye peptide, which is actually retina, so the retina peptide, okay? And also definitely the blood vessel peptide. Now, I did an interview with Karenson a few years ago and I asked him which combinations of peptides are synergistic. And we came up with various issues, problems, and three peptides okay the one that was in every single category was blood vessel yeah and when you think about it it's obvious because if you're improving blood flow you're delivering more nutrition you're removing more toxins exactly okay? so definitely the blood flow and as you said there's some cardiovascular there is a heart peptide by the way um, okay a, a heart peptide but i think the retina and the uh, uh and the blood vessel for eyesight issues 
there, there is another product I can mention, which isn't a peptide bio, or two other products I could mention, which isn't a peptide bio. We'll come back to that in a sec. The other one that has a lot of magic is the pineal peptide. Yeah. And we could go off for a whole session on the pineal gland by itself, yeah. right in the center of the brain. But I think most people know it produces melatonin amongst other. And melatonin, of course, is the core to getting all our hormones on. If, if the melatonin is gets into our blood during darkness and it's not there during light. So in other words, it's, it's telling the rest of our endocrine system when it's daytime, when it's night. So you get a nice circadian rhythm. And we all know if we fly a lot on jets or if we do shift work, how screwed up we can get in yeah. a pretty short period of time. So by adjusting the pineal, if it, as it were, you get the circadian rhythms right. If you're on a nice circadian rhythm, your hormonal cyclicity is right because hormones are coming out at different times of the day. They're not all coming out all the time. Most of them come out first thing in the morning, like growth hormone, for example, mm-hmm. like, you know, is a big boost. It's kind of the impetus to say, get up and get on with the day, right? Yeah. But there are other pulsite, smaller pulsite productions of various hormones, maybe not as much as well. So the pineal gland as what was, was put to me by a, a friend of mine and a great melatonin expert, an Italian gentleman by the name of Dr. Walter Pierpoli. And Walter said this to me many years ago, and it stuck in my mind. He said, think of the pineal gland as the conductor of the endocrine orchestra. He said, if we didn't have a conductor, what would the orchestra do? It would make noise. But it, when you have a conductor, it makes music. So yeah. the pineal peptide is having a direct action upon the pineal. I will also go out on a limb here and say that we believe it is also possibly the principal agent in elongating telomeres. Yeah. Okay. So you're getting this double whammy. You're getting yeah. these, these double. So how will it help your eyes? Well, if for any reason your circadian rhythms are out of sync, ergo your hormonal cyclicity is, and that would also mean a lessening of immune system, you know, it can get that adjusted. So those, I think, would be the three core elements. Quickly, because I (laughs) said there were two other things I wanted to mention. Yeah, please. Is a peptide. It's a dipeptide. It's it's called carnosine. Carnosine. I knew you were going to say that. Brand is can see. And although it depends on what the problem is in your eye, there are scientific studies showing it reverses cataract, eye drops. Guess what? Russian. But they come out of the Helmholtz Institute in Moscow, who gave the world cataract surgery. So anyway, so that's something you might want to look at. And another personal favorite of mine, is a, um, a herbal extract called vimpocetin or vimpocetin if you prefer to call it that comes from the periwinkle plant and it is a brilliant vasodilator and it's been proven to be of great benefit in some of the smallest arteries and capillaries which are found in the eyes and the ears nice so and it's also a pretty good nootropic as well so if you Man. want to sort of improve memory so that is one of my personal favorite supplements. Yeah, like I, the vimpato, uh, vimpato, pitosa, what is it? Vimpo, vimpocetin or vimpocetin. vimpocetin. Yeah, that one is, I've seen it around a million times for years on like a kind of a, as a satellite nootropic thing. I didn't realize it has a, a vial of uh, vasodilating properties. That I will definitely look into. The can see eye drops, I've used those with the visomitin you know, uh, eye drops for years. And I've had success with that. The, those things can burn those carnosine drops, right? Depends yeah. where you get them from. Okay. There are, oh, there really? are, there are other, like we, that would be a whole nother thing to go okay. down. But look at the pH. If the pH is around 6.5, then you have a, you have about a one in five chance of stinging. If the pH is over 6.7, you have about one in a thousand chance. Can see is actually 6.7 to 6.9. Interesting. Okay. Just, just okay. on that point, I just I should t- as we're into eyesight, I should tell you the story of Professor Svetlana Trofimova, who runs the Tree of Life Clinic in Saint Petersburg, and she is an eye expert. And of all the um, peptide um, uh, stories, if I can call it that, it is possibly the strongest one. Now you've got the public book there um, in front of you there, Stephen, uh, uh, peptides, uh, the peptide bioregulated revolution. There is another book written by the same doctor, um, called the eyesight saviors. And there's a chapter on each thing. 
but there's one chapter on the, these particular peptides. So what she does in her clinic is she uses the retina peptide firstly as an in, as an injectable, and it's injected into the orbit of the eye. So that's the sunken bit. If you think of a skull, that's okay. the sunken bit. But it is not injected into the eye. What they do is they do like pinprick, like subcutaneously into the skin around the eye, like that. And they will do that every day for 10 days. Okay? And then they will send the patient home with the boxes of the peptides. So pretty much the, um, the three I just told you. Yeah. And they would ask them to take two capsules every day. Now I'll get into dosing at the end because not everybody needs to do that. But what you see in those books, which come from her publications, are the before and after computerized topological scans of their retina. And everybody can work it out because it's very simple. The black areas is no eyesight. The red areas is very poor eyesight. The yellow areas is okay eyesight. The green areas is 2020. And you will see there was one extreme case of a lady, quite an elderly lady, who was 90% blind in her one eye. Right? Now, most people will tell you when you're that far gone on anything, the chances of making any substantive improvements are very, very low. Yeah. After a year or so, they took her back to 30% blind in that eye. Now, that may not sound like a cure if that's the word we can dare to use, but it's made such a difference in her life. It now means that she can see the grandchildren. She can see movement. She can see where the furniture is around the house, yeah. etc. But with other patients who are perhaps 10, 15, 20% blind in the eye, they're not. So, and also anybody out there who's an eye doctor, there's one particular eye problem. It's called uh, retinitis pigmentosa. It, it's almost invariably genetic. There is no clinic in the world that we have known or heard of who can do anything about it, except the Tree of Life Clinic <laughs> in St. Petersburg. Wow. Yeah, I have seen that book on your on the website, and I've almost bought it like so many times, and, and now you've just convinced me. I'm just going to load up on these things. <laughs> but um, just phenomenal, the the – the implications of the simple, like, yeah, people aren't going to be like go, going home and injecting, you know, no. I, I'm actually gotten so damn good with needles. I could, I'm comfortable doing things that were unthinkable, you know, years ago for myself. But the fact that you could take some, some, some pills and potentially regenerate some of this stuff and put some eye drops in your eyes is I mean, look at that's that's fountain of youth type stuff. I mean, that that's that kind of that, that's the whole you know that's the game. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to outsmart the you know uh, we're not trying to outsmart. Bill Lawrence is is kind of on a crusade because he meets a lot of American doctors, and of course, a lot of them. I'm not going to mention now their names. They're good people, but you know they're very proficient in what I call the American peptides you know bcp 157 or those yeah. sorts of things and he knows that they want everything injected yeah. partly because of efficacy partly because it means you have to go into the doctor's office yeah exactly <laughs> shouldn't be so facetious yeah. a good reason to see health professionals folks go and see them and um so you know but as bill's been saying you don't need to with the peptide bioregulars because they work taken orally yeah, and here's the proof. So yeah. that's what he's his next thing now that he's working on a paper is to show organ regeneration. So, and as I say, we hope in England next year he's going to come over and, and lecture on that. Yeah, so fan fantastic. Yeah, because it so makes there, me. There's a lot here. There's a lot here. Yeah, there really is, and it's exciting. I mean, let me ask you this: the the injectable epitalon is the basically the pineal gland. By a regulator, right? And synthetic yeah. pineal peptide used uh, primarily by injection. However, there there is a sublingual version of it, so spray. Okay. okay. Yeah, I've been using the epitalon with the thymolin combo oh, yeah. for I'll do a, once a year or twice a year, depending on like the the dosage. Injected. Injected. I've been doing that for a couple of years, and it does reset your. Uh, circadian rhythm and if you think about it like that's your master clock everything that's what kind of brings all allows every organ system 
to yeah. reconnect and say, we're all in the same time frame here, right? We're all in the same time frame and, and sleep improves skin quality. There's, you just feel sense of well being. It's an amazing protocol. Great for immunity. Yes. Great for stronger immunity. And this, and again, with the thymolin, which for folks out there don't know, we're talking about thymus, thymus peptide, and very, very recent studies, fair, well, fairly recent studies anyway, uh, showing that it will improve diabetic leg ulcers and similar. Oh, so really? So if you're out there with diabetic ulcers, take a look at thymolin. Wow. So if so if someone really wanted to dive into all of this stuff, where could they go? Where do you recommend they go to like learn this stuff? I mean, you obviously showed some books and do you have articles on your website? Is there something they could to you know? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Well, anyone can go to anti aging systems.com. Listen, we got thousands of stuff on there. We were talking earlier. We've been building that site ever since nineteen ninety six. Uh we've got lots of but we've got a pretty good index so if you go in or you type in peptide bioreglettes it will show you the list and stuff like that and you'll see us articles with references there'll be some podcasts there'll be some videos on there as well which are on youtube of course and but if you want a sort of uh, lighter approach have a look at our magazine which is called aging-matters.com and not every single magazine goes into peptides but there are several magazines where we've interview Cavinson, we've interviewed Bill, we, you know, work with other people who are using them. So there's quite a bit there. Or if you're on the opposite end of the scale and you want to go into a deep dive, then I have to recommend you go to Cavinson.info, which is Professor Cavinson's site where, you know, the medical publications are listed. Fantastic. I will definitely put links to everything you just mentioned in there. And I've I've read a ton of your articles over the last 10 years. And, and like I told you in the, before we were talking, it's been almost like this, like this, like dirty little, like private area, like underground medicine that no one knew about for so long. And I'm like, how come no one knows about this? I'm like, this stuff is gold, you know? I sometimes say to my team, I think we should be on the dark web actually. <laughs> But I mean, the, the, the stuff is so well written, the information and uh, everything that's on those, you know, like in that suite of sites that you guys kind of all work together, the international anti-aging systems and profound health and all that, like the, there's some amazing products on there as well. Besides we we tried very hard, you know, I've been doing it for over 30 years, right from the inception, we were interested in preventative and regenerative medicine. And we've tried very hard to work with very serious people. You know, you'll see the names on our websites. You'll, you'll even have testimonials from well-known doctors saying, I like working with IS, which is very nice, where it makes me very humble. You know, people that I started out as heroes have become friends. So I feel very, uh, very honored uh, in that position. But everything is referenced. We tell you who said it. We tell you where it came from. We give you the PubMed where, where it is available. We're not making anything up. And yeah. even though I'm, there are several stories on our website, this being one of them, where a lot of people say, I find that very hard to believe, especially when they hear that the information is decades old, not yeah. five minutes ago. But then one of my little jokes is because who's re there are a million medical publications every year. There are 50 million online. And I'm just talking about medical publications, not general health and fitness okay yeah. who's going who's reading all that so my little joke is when people say oh i can't believe it or it sounds too good to be true and i say it's published and they go it can't be i say well you know if you want to keep something a secret publish it yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean i just am so baffled that this stuff is still relegated to some sort of like, yeah, it's, you know, not real medicine type thing. And it's like, I get it because it, it kind of flies in the face of traditional medicine. It's like, it's like the body using its own innate intelligence to fix its own self in a, in a way that's built upon nature, you know? I think you know what the problem is, Stephen, but for folks out there who may not, medicine has been arranged, and I'm going to be very outspoken here, into a kind of cartel. If you go back to how allopathic medicine started with John D. Rockefeller back in the 20s and 30s, fantastic book to read by one of my heroes, Edward G. Griffin, uh, called World Without Cancer. We'll explain that, how it came about. And, you know, and since then, doctors have been trained in this closed school about it's basically how to sell their products. 
And if you come along with a product, as the great Dr. Berlinski in America, one of the very, very, very few people who has ever got a drug approved by the FDA who isn't a big pharmaceutical company, you find out that you need so much money and resources. I mean, it's over a billion dollars now. Yeah. And not many people have that kind of money to invest. And the other problem is, and this is a, the thing that comes up, if you go to a big pharmaceutical company, let's say you've got the cure for cancer, right? And you go along and say, look at this. And they'll go, wow, that's fantastic. But the first question will be, can we patent it? And if it's a natural molecule, it's very, very difficult to get a controlling patent. And you're not going to spend a billion dollars to get that approved. And it could still take 10, even more years to then find that everybody can sell it because you didn't get a patent. Yeah. And so lots of things get written off, especially natural molecules. And so they never get in front of the doctors who are working in orthodox medicine, as I like to call it. Yeah. Now, it's a great point. I mean, basically, medicine is politics. I mean, that, that's what it's become. It is. Right? In fact, I, I, I go even further. Now I'm getting to a certain age. I'm getting a bit bolder, I suppose. Um, and I say the trouble with medicine is it's sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I've got a lot of good nuggets I'm probably going to be using from you for the rest of the, the year. But, uh, you know, I mean, like uh, my recommendation, I'm just going to throw something out there. Like if you're listening to this podcast and take the lowest hanging fruit that you've got, pick something. If you, if, Let's say you, you, so you can't even think of anything. Take a pineal gland, take a, thy, a thymus bioregulator and add the, the blood flow, the um, blood vessels. Yeah, Good add job. those, take those three and do a protocol. And maybe you could tell us like the best protocol and cool. start with that and see if you do not have a circadian rhythm reset, if you do not feel better in some regard, and if you do just build off that protocol, now start attacking or going after some things maybe where you have weaknesses that you feel like you can regenerate, right? Right. I mean, no, you're just, absolutely right, Stephen. If, if you know your weaknesses, if you know that you have weak adrenal glands, as an example, or a poor thyroid, then bang, you've got a target to go for, right? If you don't, and you're not doing testing that shows anything, the only other way to do it is look at your family history. What do mum and dad suffer with, grandparents, whatever, or brothers and sisters? Even. You know, yeah. of course, a lot of families have a specific problem not all families of course but you can look at a family and say they get a lot of cancer they get a lot of heart disease they get a lot of diabetes as a general rule that tends to happen so that's another yeah. way of coming at it but the three you've just said pineal thymus blood vessel very good choice and one of the and that's the three i go on regularly oh, and i'll nice. tell you about those just a second and why do i say that because some of the actual clinical trials, the big human clinical trials that were done in the Soviet Union are so massive and so unbelievable that most pharmaceutical companies would, would fall over. The biggest one they ever did was with the workers in Gazprom, which is Russia's oil and gas uh, industry. And this is in Siberia. It's a pretty tough environment, right? Even living yeah. in is not an office worker in New York. Okay. Um, so that's pretty tough. And wait for it. They studied just over 11,000 people and they've monitored them over, although I have to admit the numbers went down with the years, but I'll get into that, over 12 years. And they put 3,000 of those 11,000 people on multivitamins as a placebo. So people didn't know if they were getting the peptides or the vitamins. So about 8,000 people on the peptides, about 3,000 people on the vitamins. These people started at the age of sort of like 40 to 60. Of course, some of these folks had re well retired when they were following up with them 12 years later. And I would want to point out that in that part of Russia, the average longevity of people is not as good. OK, it's not yeah. what it is in the West. OK, so long story short, what happened? What happened was that at the end of the study period, the people in the peptide group had one third of the morbidity of those in the vitamin group. In other words, they suffered from two thirds less wow. disease. And, and that's a big number. That's right? huge. But beyond that, believe it or not, I'm going to keep coming back to this number of 30%, and I'll get into that if you want me to. It seems to be a biological cell reserve. Okay. Huh. 
they also, the people in the peptide group, had one third of the mortality. In other words, they were two thirds less likely to die. Huh. Okay, so that's a big number, isn't it? And the three that stood out on regular use were the three you've already mentioned, pineal, thymus, blood vessel. That's not to say in other trials they didn't use other peptides and other groups of people they didn't use it. There was another study in tractor workers in a, in a city called Kazan, which is central Russia, got very, there was 3,000 people in that study. Again, big number, uh, I think over six years, if I remember rightly, very similar results. And then there was another factory in what we now call the Ukraine, and I think that was a 1,000 people studied over five years, and it was a car factory, very similar results. So they have done, they have done this, and they've done it in a big way. So, so the that studies the, are out there. They're studies done. Are studies are out there. Studies are out there. Unbelievable. So, and of course, they did it in animals prior to that, and they did it in vitro prior to that. So yeah, they did. They did all their homework. You know. Yeah. They did it properly. And so, what else can we say? I could tell you the, the Olympic story. I mean, as yourself, as an Olympian, please, um, you might like this one. So, in specifically, of course, these substances are not on any banned list you know it's very unless, unless you want to ban eating meat and plants it's going to be quite tricky isn't it yeah but basically um it was the when, when was the london olympics 20, 2012 2012 thank you 2012 it was so this is or was the russian uh, women's olympic team who won gold at the 2012 london olympics and I've got a great picture of the girls standing there with their coach and, and Cavinson actually, Compressor Cavinson in the middle and the various coaches. So what can we say about these girls? Well, top of their game. If, if you win a gold at the Olympics, aren't you at the top of your game? Yeah. You must be, mustn't you? you right, you, top of their game. Yeah. And so, and there's, of course, no arguing about their fitness. You know, they're 20-year-olds who can, you know, do what gymnasts do. So, I mean, yeah. just incredible. But when they came back, to Russia with their gold medals, the Institute decided to run some blood work on and they were actually shocked that their telomeres were equivalent to a 40 year old. Wow. Not a 20 year old gold winner. Wow. And the theory is that whilst I think everything in life is on a is on a curve and that curve is either U shape or bell shape. What am I talking about? Too much or too little of anything, yeah. whether it's drinking water or whatever it is, or even exercise, can be damaging. You yes. want to be in the middle. The middle might be there or the middle might be there, but the middle yeah. can be there. So the theory is that their intensive exercise regime leading up to the Olympics was too much. Here's the good news. They put them on a number of peptides and they found that within two to three weeks, it may have been four weeks, their telomeres normalized. Wow. Because, and they did the same thing with their cosmonauts. You send the cosmonauts off, for long periods in space and i know they exercise in space now but nonetheless if they're up there for a year and they come back to the planet they're a bit of a mess yeah and, and they're weak despite for doing sure yeah in space. what they find is they put them on the peptides they induce protein synthesis and they can normalize them within one to three months absolutely so something very fundamental going on yeah um, cavinson yeah. tells me that the chinese are doing it as well i've got no evidence of that but they're open about this um, there's a paper on it about these Russian girls, and so you can go and read it for yourself. So, so yeah, so there's a lot there's a lot of avenues you can go down with this, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I look as somebody who trained as hard as a human being. Mm -hmm. I, I I I literally trained so hard one time that my body wouldn't let me actually get on the equipment. It like wouldn't send the signal. Like it basically said, I'm done, you know? And I mean, you, when you talk about performance and world-class caliber performance, that is not good for health. Like I'm sure my telomeres shortened so much from gymnastics, but that's why I'm into this stuff now, you know, so well, that yeah, but the good news is you can resurrect it. Yeah. It's not a one-way street, you know, it's, it, you can do something about it. You're, it, you're saying that you, um, got this kind of shock before you got on the equipment. I get that before I get in the car to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's glad, I'm glad to, you know, I'm in good company here. I'm not the only one that was. <laughs> got to have a laugh. You know, life, life's got to be fun. Have a laugh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize there was so much published 
I I had no idea, to be honest with you, and I, I feel a little irresponsible in that regard. I'm one of the persons who clearly have, I just read enough books and articles on this stuff and, and have used it enough to be like, I know it's working. I, I, I Unequivocally, I know 100%. I can feel it. And, and But when you're trying to convince people, especially- <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'll tell you my story. When I first met Cameronson in 2009, 2010, I had that light bulb moment. I, I came back and I told everybody, I said, this is incredible. I've got to look into this. This is amazing. And But I was still skeptical. First time you ever hear anything and you go, I, I don't know. It sounds good, but I don't know. And then over about the course of a year, I, I read more. I looked in. I started talking to people I knew. And I met him again, funnily enough, in Brussels. And I, that, on that occasion, I was able to have a one-to-one -one chat with him. And we sat down you know, with a drink and had a good chat. And it was sinking into the gray matter about two years in i thought okay let's get hold of some of this stuff and let's start finding out and initially i sent the samples as it were out to doctors i work with quite a lot and people i know very well and i still was skeptical i was still sitting on the fence saying i don't think <laughs> i'm going to hear anything back i was i was literally expecting to hear that used it for three months nothing you know i go because i thought everything came back was so positive i I was flabbergasted, to be honest, you know. Yeah. And it, it has been quite something. I mean, there are, I'm not going to lie to you. There are certain peptides that seem to have a more profound, um, faster action than others. One of them, for example, is the adrenals. Of course, it depends if you have a problem or not. But I think there's, again, a lot of people out there, older people, who are having adrenal fatigue. You know, yeah. they get to, I don't know, three o'clock in the afternoon and they want to go and lie down, don't they? Yeah. That's a quick fix. The thymus, uh, sorry, the thyroid is another one that people get fast results on because suddenly you're sleeping better, energy's better, yeah. temperature regulation's better. By the way, nice easy way, I like to actually look at what doctors did before there were blood tests. You know, th that was a time when they actually spoke to patients and asked them questions. <laughs> Uh, but all, but because we've gone, I'm not saying that blood tests are irrelevant, not by any means, of course, but there's a lot that can be gleaned from talking to the patients, asking questions, looking at them, physically yeah. looking at them. Brilliant book on this by the great endocrinologist Thierry Hertog of Belgium. It's called The Atlas of Endocrinology. Mm. It's a pictorial book of what you look like if you're too high or too low in a specific hormone. Oh, awesome. Real people, you know, amazing, amazing little reference guide that is. And that's how, and of course, the thing about Thierry is his father was an endocrinologist, his grandfather. He's a legend. He's amazing. That yeah. comes from about four or five generations of endocrinologists. So they've got pictures going back to the, early 1900s of people it's just incredible yeah. so so with with that in mind with with the thyroid the old-fashioned way of apart from you know do you have cold hands and feet and you know are you sluggish and all, all those questions is take your temperature first thing in the morning yeah. okay now i'm going to speak celsius so if you need fahrenheit get your calculator out but <laughs> yeah, first thing you do get out of bed in the morning and right where's the thermometer stick it in the ear stick it on the forehead as you can now and write that number down OK, and do that for about two weeks and then look at that list and ask yourself, where are you now? A good, healthy thyroid gland. You should be Celsius between 36.3 and 36.7. If you're in that banding, well done, healthy thyroid. But if you are regularly below 36.3 and i've even heard of people being down to 34.7 30 which is really low but even yeah. if you're into 35s or something like that you definitely have a weak thyroid okay and conversely if you are regularly over 36.7 you could well be hyperthyroid okay and so whatever it is you do in your life whether it's consuming iodine taking thyroid hormones using the thyroid peptide whatever it is you're going to do Keep monitoring yourself and watch your numbers change. Mm. Obviously, I'm talking here about hypothyroidism. Yeah. It's that accurate. You can literally monitor yourself by 0.1 degrees Celsius. That's a, I, I really like that approach of, I mean, look, we, I use blood tests. I test my own blood for certain things. I've learned how to do it for, I've been doing it for so long, but... Mm -hmm. There is there is a way that there's some after you can look at certain people and you can say oh they look like they're this or they look like they're low in thyroid or you know like I mean, people with low Absolutely. thyroid typically hair starts falling out you know they're cold hands and you know 
but uh, I yeah. think that book is probably a good resource to, to yeah. dig into and to kind by, of. By the way, some people say the Mona Lisa was hyperthyroid, and you can tell that by looking at her. There you go. Friendly. Oh, because of the, <laughs> the bug eyes? The bug eyes? Is it? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Also, that picture is so alluring for, to, to people. You say, what is it about her? And a lot of hyperthyroid people have that. They have, some of them have the deer in the headlights look. Yeah. You know? it's a, but, yeah. But, you know, it's a bit more extreme, but. but. Yeah, but well, that's energy. You can see, you can sense this energy. You can see this energy. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, this has just been very fruitful. And again, for everyone listening, I will put links to everything in the show notes. Also, we'll have a, we will have a discount for um, bioregulating peptides for you. It'll be, check out the resources. Uh, we're setting all that stuff up right now. But again, it's at stephenmccain.com bio slash or backslash bioregulators. <laughs> Gosh, stephenmccain.com backslash bioregulators. And Phil, man, I, I feel like I could just talk to you all day about this stuff. I mean, what a pleasure it we chatted for an hour, I think, before we even started this. Yeah, we did. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I like, you know, I, I've reached a point in my life where if people are not interested in what I have to say, I ain't going to waste any time because yeah. I can move on and I don't want to stress myself out as well. I don't, I'm not here to, to, to convince people of anything. But when I've got somebody like yourself who really is interested and we can share stuff, yeah. then I really enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I, I you're my kind of guy. I really enjoy you know, I'm so glad we, we met and by all means, yeah, do not be a stranger. Like if you think of anything or you just like, oh, I think Steve would like this, you know, you feel free to reach out. I mean, I, I, and, and thank you for introducing to my uh, audience, you know, these bioregulators, these magic, simple, organic compounds that, that have, that can bring the body back into homeostasis. I mean, what an incredible, there is no risk to trying this stuff as far as I'm concerned. No. Right? I mean, I've got several, what I call wow stories, and we can get into some of the others at some other future point if you ever want to hear them, but none of them are as broad in their possibilities as this one other ones are quite specific for this problem or that problem but yeah. these have enormous implications you, oh, were you going to tell one or yeah well, well, <laughs> <laughs> well one of the other wow stories <laughs> one of the other wows uh, well, I, well we mentioned cancer which rem which can remove cataracts with an eye drop i think that's a, a pretty wow story yeah yeah there's a, a skin cream that comes from the island of Vanuatu, believe it or not, which is near New Zealand. And people, it, it, this is almost the sort of thing that gets you deplatformed by saying this, and you can cut it out afterwards. But has been shown in 80,000 patient cases to be 100% successful in removing skin cancer. Wow. And they, know, and they know why, and it's been published for over 30 years, mainly in Australasian publications. Interesting. So that's... I, maybe you want another session on that some other time. Yeah, uh, is all this stuff on the um, on the articles? Okay. And it's been in our magazine as well. And I am delighted to say that Bill Edward Cham, the man who discovered this and spent twenty years of his life working on it, who lives is a biochemist who lives in um, Vanuatu, is coming to England next year to tell us all about it. So I've never met him in person, so I'm really looking forward to that. Fantastic. Well. Phil, I will. Um, I'm, I'm definitely gonna, you know, get get back on some of your bioregulators, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look at some of these books. I highly recommend uh, check out the resources for this podcast. And Phil, I I love it. I thank you so much for bringing you know this killer knowledge, and uh, you know this this is the kind of stuff that can change people's lives. You know, someone's listening to this and they try it, and all of a sudden it's like you change the course of someone's life. You know, and and. And I, so I respect that. And uh, I look forward to seeing you when you come to Vegas, potentially A4M, you know? Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. You'll have to buy me a mojito, though. Okay. Oh, I'll buy you a mojito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd be great. Fantastic. Great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. Thanks again, Phil. And for everyone that's tuned in, thank you for. Uh, listening to this episode, by the way, if I'm coming out of the closet here, and I I had the the most famous virus again right now, so oh, I'm like, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I'm dealing with it. I think I dealt with it pretty well. I, I'm still recovering, but uh, I didn't want to miss this podcast. And uh, so check out the show note, re- uh, show note re- resources. Stay on, you, stay on after you stop because I'd like to tell you something. Okay, definitely. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode of the Steve McCain Podcast. Stay healthy, everyone. Thanks, guys.